What's going on, everybody? Good Mike Work Commentaries back at you with episode 513. Look at that. I did wind up coming up here after all. For those of you who may have joined me on Monday night for the live Raw Watch Along, I did mention a couple of times throughout the stream that I may not get up here for a regular podcast this week. I really wasn't sure if there was enough going on to fill a full episode, so I thought maybe I would give you guys a one-off episode instead and maybe work on a couple of other special videos that I have coming to the channel the next couple of weeks. But as I started making my notes for the week, I was like, yeah, definitely. I've got enough information here uh, to fill a full podcast episode. So this one is going to be a little bit different than most episodes. I'm not going to do a complete review of Raw and SmackDown this week. I'm only going to talk about the main points, and there's a couple of really big controversial heel turns taking place on both brands right now with Braun Strowman on Raw and Becky Lynch over on SmackDown. So you will get my full opinions on those two debacles later on uh, in this commentary. I'll also talk about some of the other big news like uh, the Kevin Owens quitting angle, uh, what's next for Ronda Rousey and Nikki Bella, and shit like that. And we've got a pretty good amount of matches also officially announced for Hell in the Cell, so we'll preview that whole card. And we've got a few matches already set for the Super Showdown as well. I think we've got a total of four or five matches officially announced for that show in Australia coming up in a couple of weeks. And of course, this coming Saturday, September 1st, is the big all-in show in Chicago that Cody and the Bucks are putting on. It looks like it's going to be a huge success. The card looks stacked. We know we're going to get a ton of surprises, and it's a sellout out, and I think they're going to do well in pay-per-view, and I think already before the show has even happened, it is a complete success. So I will preview that whole card and let you know what my plans are for this Saturday as well coming up later on in the podcast. Before we start talking about everything, though, I would just like to dedicate this week's episode to a very close personal family friend of mine. He was one of my father's best friends. I think he met him around the time that they were in college. I mean, they were tight. He was one of his boys. I've known this guy since I was seven years old, and he's been battling terminal cancer now for, I would say, close to 10 years. And the last three or so years have been horrendously brutal on this guy. He has suffered more than any human being should ever have to suffer. And I just found out a couple of hours ago before recording this podcast here that he did in fact pass away today. And he was an incredibly great man and a great friend uh, to my dad and the entire family. I remember when I was a kid, um, my parents or my, my dad would have like poker nights uh, with all of his friends. And every couple of weeks, it would be my dad's turn to host it at the house. And they would have about 20 people over. We'd have people upstairs and downstairs. And my dad and Joe, were always, you know, right in the middle of it. They kind of organized the whole thing. And at that age, I didn't really understand the concept of jokes and ribbing. Uh, most guys that might be listening to this podcast right now, you know how it is. You get together with your boys, you're hanging out, you're at a bar or wherever. What are you doing? You're fucking with each other all the time. And that's what I do to my friends. I'm constant. I'm the Owen Hart of my group. I've always got some shit to say or to pull on someone. And Joe was a lot like that. And I remember... One night at poker, my dad has got this like lucky silver dollar that he's had his whole life or some shit like that. And Joe takes it and throws it out the window outside onto the grass. I go storming out the door, finding the silver dollar. I bring it back in. I'm stomping my feet up the deck and I shove that silver dollar in Joe's face and I say, you don't ever throw my daddy's silver dollar ever. And I'm like screaming at him. And uh, that's like my first memory of Joe is that stupid little seven-year-old Greg didn't understand the concept of a rib and I freaked out. But Joe Joe was an incredibly good man, uh, lived in Detroit his whole life, was a season ticket holder to the Detroit Red Wings, um, went to Michigan State, and uh, spent his whole life in Michigan, never left, where uh, a lot of his friends and my family uh, did. But uh, they stayed in touch, and uh, my parents visited him well, at least two times a year. Um, so he was a great man, and I just want to, I know it doesn't mean anything to you guys, uh, you don't even know who the hell I'm talking about here, but I just wanted to open up with a little tribute about Joe, because I've known this guy for about 35 years, and he was just an incredibly great man and uh, just reminds you how bad cancer sucks. Um, absolutely horrible. So if you have loved ones or uh, people you care about, hug them tight because uh, this is a horrible disease that's uh, just taken way too many lives. And I guarantee you uh, that uh, a good portion of you listening to this have experience dealing with this type of thing. And uh, it's just a shame. So anyway, just wanted to open up there uh, with a little Tribute to Joe. Rest in peace. You're a great man, and I'm glad uh, you finally got bailed out of this horrible mess that you have been forced to suffer, and I'm glad uh, that that suffering is over. Uh, let's get in to the podcast now and talk about the issues at hand this week. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to completely roll through Monday Night Raw and SmackDown and talk about every single match. I'm only talking about the big angles, and there's only a few, so this is probably going to be a pretty quick rundown of both shows. The biggest news of the week on WWE TV, arguably, is another 
Head scratching heel turn. WWE is at it again. They figured that it wasn't enough to do this shit over on SmackDown. They're going to do it on Raw too. And of course, we saw, I guess, what was the heel turn of Braun Strowman. Now, normally, I don't really care that Braun Strowman is a heel. He's a badass monster. I would actually prefer him as a heel. I would have been fine if he never turned babyface to begin with. But to make him a heel now in a situation that really seemed out of nowhere, this is not something that they teased. This is not something that we could feel coming three, four weeks ago. You know what I mean? This seems like it really came out of the blue. And I think that's what I didn't like the most about it is because it seemed like a decision that might have been made over lunch that day backstage at Raw. I mean, that's just the impression that I got. Uh, We, of course, saw the whole thing set up in the beginning of the show with Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman. They had a promo together. Braun Strowman said that he wants Roman to meet him in the middle of the ring on Raw or whatever. So Roman came out there first. Braun Strowman then followed. And as the two of them agree to face each other at Hell in the Cell, they actually shake hands. And I'm watching this on the live stream like losing my shit i'm like does anybody remember a year ago when these guys literally tried to murder each other they're out there shaking hands now what the fuck and they were then interrupted by dolph ziggler and drew mcintyre who wound up challenging them to a tag team match essentially i think baron corbin came out and officially made the match official for the main event it was going to be Strowman and roman teaming up to face drew and dolph and right away i didn't like that because why is it that every single time probably in the last 25 to 30 years, especially during the Attitude Era, it was super common. Anytime you had two top baby faces feuding with each other, you always, you always, 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 fucking always in every single situation, one million percent of the time, have to team them up in a tag team at least once on Monday Night Raw. Every fucking time. And so when they initially made this match, I was like, this is stupid. Why in the hell are Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman together? They should not want anything to do with each other. I don't give a shit if they're both baby faces. They should not be in the ring together. They should not be shaking hands. They should not be talking to each other in the locker room backstage. None of that shit. Roman Reigns tried to take Braun Strowman's life in an ambulance at Great Balls of Fire. I don't know about you guys, but if someone attempts to murder you, I wouldn't trust them for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? So we get to the main event. It's Strowman and Roman versus Dolph and Drew. Roman starts off the match, and uh, he winds up getting double teamed. Dolph and Drew are just beating the shit out of him, and Strowman is standing there on the ring apron literally doing nothing. He's just standing there watching. And eventually he gets in the ring, backs off Dolph and Drew, only to pick Roman Reigns up and start beating the crap out of him. So I don't know if they were trying to play this off like Dolph, Drew, and Braun had this plan the whole time, or if this was Braun acting on his own, deciding to turn on Roman Reigns and then celebrate with Dolph and Drew. So looks like they formed an alliance here between the three of them. According to WWE.com, they're calling themselves the Super Team. Wow, how original, the Super Team. But they kind of are. I mean, I like the faction in a vacuum by itself. I have no problem with these three guys teaming up to form a three-man faction. Drew McIntyre, Braun Strowman, Dolph Ziggler, not exactly the worst talent out there. And when you compare them to The Shield, I mean, The Shield's resumes are obviously better. Many more championships have been won on The Shield side of things than on the uh, Super Team side of things. But still, I almost think they're more impressive. I mean, Seth Rollins, I think, is the best one of all six of them as far as in the ring, but Dolph Ziggler is not far behind. Braun Strowman is the biggest and baddest and a hell of a lot more over than Roman Reigns. And Drew McIntyre also has some size and some would say wrestling ability over Roman Reigns as well, which just leaves you Dean Ambrose, who I think might be outmatched by all three of the guys on the super team. So, you know, I might even give the nod to Strowman, McIntyre, and Dolph just for being the more impressive unit. And that's saying something since I'm a huge shield mark. So that shows you how objective my opinions are. But, you know, it's a pretty good showdown here between these two groups. My only problem with it is, is it was like way out of left field. And why are they just throwing Strowman together with these two guys? This is somebody that's never needed anybody. He's taken on the whole locker room in a fight before. Why the hell does he need people watching his back? I understand that Roman's got some backup because of the shield reuniting last week on Raw. But to go out there and form a faction like this, it seems like it's going to have a very short short shelf life. I can't imagine these three guys sticking together for any sort of long-term angle. By the time we get to the Royal Rumble, this team will be long since disbanded. And I just uh, I just much rather would have seen the Wyatt family back up Strowman. I know, yes, that's a match we've seen before, Shield and the Wyatts, but 
2018 version of all six of these guys I think would be a lot of fun and the alliance between Strowman, Wyatt, and Harper would make a lot more sense than the one with Dolph and Drew. All you would have to do is figure out a way to get Luke Harper over to Raw and uh, the team is there. So if I had my way, I would rather see that happen, but what can you do? We now have the match all set with Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns at Hell in the Cell. This match will also be inside the Hell in the Cell to kind of keep the factions out, but you know that's not going to happen. I think I pitched the idea in the live stream on Monday that Strowman is going to lift up the cell and allow people to crawl in underneath. I pitched the idea before Strowman turned heel of maybe him turning heel at Hell in the Cell and starting a new shield with Seth and Dean. Maybe he lifts up the cage and says, come on in, boys. And the two of them come in and they turn on Roman Reigns. And it's the three new shield members with their new leader, Braun Strowman, new WWE champion, turning on Roman Reigns. But it looks like they're going this direction instead. Um, you know, my early prediction for Hell in the Cell is that I just don't see Roman dropping it yet, which sucks. Uh, maybe they're adding all of these other elements into this match so Strowman can somehow lose without being pinned or anything like that, or really being beaten clean, I should say. So maybe, you know, Dolph and Drew and the Shield being out there, they'll get involved somehow. It's going to be a big-ass clusterfuck. And then when the smoke clears, somehow Roman is able to hit a spear and get the pin somehow and retain the title. That's what I would guess at this point. Uh, doesn't mean that's what I want to see happen. And I've been I've been team Braun Strowman since day one. I thought this guy should have been uh, WWE Universal Champion a year ago. So it would be really nice if he could win the belt here at Hell in a Cell. But, you know, considering that Roman beat Brock for it, and that was a long run in the very first pay-per-view after SummerSlam, I don't see them taking the belt off of Roman. If they did, what that tells me is the only reason they put the belt on Roman to begin with at SummerSlam is because they wanted Roman's name in the record books as the one that ended Brock Lesnar's streak instead of... Uh, Braun Strowman, I would suppose. So aside from that, I think Roman somehow, hook or crook, winds up uh, retaining the title here. Uh, again, a lot of people have been saying this about Roman Reigns. They said it last week about The Shield, and now they're saying it about Braun Strowman, and that is WWE's desperate attempt to try to get Roman cheered. Now, The Shield reuniting, I completely defended, because all I've heard people say about Roman Reigns for the past couple of years is that the biggest problem with him is that the WWE books him like shit, and I've maintained that ever since day one as well. I've always said that Roman Reigns has the look, he's got the size, he's got the ability, he's got the bloodline, and he's got the work ethic. Aside from that uh, one little hiccup there with the wellness policy, you know, he's pretty much been a company guy. So there's a lot of parts of him that are John Cena 2.0, but there's a lot of parts that aren't. You know, D Roman Reigns is not all goody two-shoes. I just said a minute ago that last year he tried to murder Braun Strowman. John Cena never tried to murder anybody, but it's still that lame type of baby face shoved down your throat bullshit that we are feeling and we are experiencing again with Roman Reigns after dealing with it with John Cena for like eight years. So the fans are really turned off by this shit and I don't blame him. But the problem I have with everybody that's mad about the shield is that your logic is fucking stupid. Because everybody says Roman Reigns should be booked better. It's not necessarily Roman Reigns. It's WWE's use of him. So what do they do? They book him better. They reunite him with the Shield. A group that was super over. The last time anybody gave a shit about Roman Reigns is when he was in the Shield. So WWE does that to try to present Roman in a more entertaining way, which I think a Shield reunion is the perfect more entertaining way to do things. But still, you know what the fans say? Not good enough. You know what they're doing? They're saying that WWE, this is just a ploy. This is just a silly political ploy by WWE to get the fans to cheer for Roman Reigns. And I'm like, isn't that the fucking point? Don't you want these wrestlers to be booked better? That's what they did with the Shield reunion. But instead, the fans are, oh, it's just a ploy. So the bottom line here is, is you just don't like Roman Reigns. Why don't you just admit it? I would respect people so much more if they would just say in the comments section or on Twitter or whatever, if they just said, I don't like Roman Reigns no matter what. My mind can't be changed. I just hate him. You know, because at least you're being honest. At least you know you have no real arguments. You just hate the fucking guy. And there's a similar point to be made with Becky Lynch and her whole heel turn at SummerSlam. And I think the fans' reaction to the whole thing would have been a lot different if Becky would have won the title. But I'll get into that later. So basically what I'm saying is I completely understand the complaints about Roman Reigns. But wouldn't you rather see him reunited with the Shield than be that stupid, lame, big dog, yard, promo-cutting douche that he is right now? 
the fans cannot stand him. But if you put Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose with him, two baby faces that are a lot more over than Roman, I think that can help the whole overall value of your main event guy right now. And don't give me any shit about Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose being a lackey or being held back. Oh, fuck off with that. I think uh, Seth Rollins, aside from the great in-ring work that he always has, aside from that, has Seth Rollins really been setting the world on fire in his promos or anything like that? I don't see associating himself with Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose is going to harm him what so fucking ever. And the same goes for Dean Ambrose. So, you know, to me, I was happy with the Shield reunion. And hey, look at it logically. A lot of people that people hate Roman Reigns, so they're not going to say this. But if this was any other faction reuniting, if this was the NWO or the Four Horsemen or something like that reuniting, you know, after a few years off, and then the very next week, they're beat down and laid out and look like chumps in the middle of the ring. Everybody would be complaining that that's bad booking. What are you doing, WWE? You just brought the shield back. Now you're going to have them demolished and destroyed seven days after they got back together. That's crazy. But that's what they did on Monday Night Raw, and nobody gave a shit. Nobody questioned the stupidity of that booking. They thought it was all perfectly fine, but I guarantee you, you put anybody else in those shoes in that situation, and the fans would be freaking the fuck out. You know it's true. At the end of the day, I'm 100% on board with complaining about Roman Reigns. Nobody gets it more than me. But I am truly trying to look at this objectively, and I think there's so much Roman Reigns hate out there that it completely clouds people's judgment, and it just fucks them up. And they cannot think objectively, and they certainly can't speak on wrestling objectively because they're too hung up on some fucking wrestler they hate. So I think the wrestling fans really do themselves a disservice, and I've been mentioning this since the John Cena days. Uh, What sucks about this is they take all of the elements about their arguments that are true, but it gets completely buried under all of their other untruths, their hate, and their obsessions. And that's the problem. It's like they don't know when to quit when they're ahead. One minute you're complaining about WWE's use of Roman Reigns, next thing you know, he's a lazy, talentless fuck who can't wrestle who should be killed and blah 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 you know you know how crazy it gets we've all heard this shit about john cena so here we are in 2018 and the wrestling fans are no more mature than they were back in 2010 the other big news on monday night raw was the angle of kevin owens quitting i liked this this is exactly what he needs he needs to get the fuck out of there for a while and kind of regroup you know what i mean so he has a barn burner of an intercontinental title match with seth rollins seth issued an open challenge owens accepted and they had a great little match for the ic title on raw uh kevin owens wound up losing clean i believe seth rollins hit him with the curb stomp uh, for the win there and after the match they go to commercial they come back and kevin owens is still in the ring he's sitting in a chair with a microphone mick foley did something similar like 20 years ago and it kind of reminded me of that and i said when i saw him sitting there i'm like he's gonna quit and he just picks up the mic and he says I quit and he walks away and of course the whole thing is on camera and the camera is you know following back him back to the locker room and shit like that so I actually had people in the chat thinking that this was like legit and I'm like no dudes come on we're all smarter than that we should be able to see from nine miles away if something's a work or not and that clearly was so Kevin Owens is not going anywhere he will not be at all in on Saturday I'll tell you what man if WWE wanted to make it real If WWE really wanted to make this real, they would let him show up at All In, you know, just out of respect for Dusty, you know, let's just let's just do something for Cody. Let's do something for his kid putting on this show. Let's uh, let Kevin Owens quit. You know, we'll let him show he can show up there as Kevin Steen. But do you think WWE is interested in helping those guys out? Hell no. But I think it would be really cool if they really wanted to fool a few people, you know, to have him show up there. Because uh, then a lot of people, you know, casual fans might buy into it. So just an idea, even though that idea will not happen. But uh, my only hope here is that when he comes back, I don't know how long he's going to be off of TV. Uh, Maybe he's requested time off. Maybe he's got to just, you know, nurse some nagging injuries and he's going to take two, three weeks off or whatever. Whatever he winds up doing, I just don't want them to fuck it up like they did with, um, was it Ziggler? Didn't Ziggler quit like last year and then he was gone and then his return just sucked. I think he came back in the Rumble, right? Didn't he come back in the Royal Rumble? And uh, you just, I just was anticipating something much bigger when he finally returned. So I am worried that when Kevin Owens does come back, the angle that's really meant to help refresh and rejuvenate his character is going to be a failure. I think there's a lot they could do here, but I also think there's a lot WWE could screw up. Uh, we saw the return on Monday Night Raw of the lovely, beautiful Trish Stratus. Uh, Raw, of course, was in Toronto, and Elias was out there singing and shit talking the audience until uh, Trish Stratus shows up and. And uh, cuts a promo on him. 
giving him shit for talking bad about her hometown and then unleashes a vicious slap. And uh, the whole thing wound up turning into a giant women's segment. Elias, after being bitch slapped, walks away. And then we had Ronda Rousey and Natalia coming out to the ring to join Trish Stratus. And then Alexa Bliss and Alicia Fox came onto the stage and they introduce Mickey James as well. So it winds up being a one-on-one match with Natalia and Alicia Fox. Natalia taps her out with the sharpshooter. And then the whole thing ends with a big selfie backstage. I think they ran into the Bella Twins backstage or were the Bella Twins out in the ring. I actually forgot where the hell the Bellas were, um, but they were all celebrating. All the baby faces were celebrating and smiling together. I kind of like Ronda Rousey, how she's kind of like Finn Balor. She's evil, vicious, determined. I'm going to kill you, Ronda Rousey, during her title matches and pay-per-view matches. But she's smiley, happy Ronda Rousey in every other segment. So I kind of like that she's got kind of dueling personalities there. I've noticed that about her, and uh, I actually am okay with it, and I like it. And I think she's doing well. But it was kind of just a little bit too much. I've mentioned this before. There's way too much friendliness going on in the women's division. I understand that the women's division is evolving and they're making a lot of major steps and major advancements in the division, you know, with the Royal Rumbles and the Hell in the Cell matches and, you know, and the two world titles and all that stuff. So all that's great, but it's just a little bit too much smiling, a little bit too much hugging, a little too much hand holding, and there was a lot of that going on on Monday Night Raw. So backstage, we had Ronda Rousey, we had Natalia, we had Trish Stratus, and I think both of the Bellas or one of the Bellas or some shit. Uh, uh, took a big selfie backstage in a backstage segment. So there's been a lot of rumors now that the Bellas are back on the scene that Nikki Bella, yes, you heard me right, Nikki Bella could potentially main event. You heard me right again, main event. I'll say it one more time, main event, evolution against Ronda Rousey. I'm just going to take a second to allow you guys to let that sink in, what I just fucking said there. I think if I was listing out all of the potential opponents that I would like to see Ronda Rousey face, Nikki Bella would be way near the bottom. Somewhere near Hornswoggle, I imagine. Like, goddamn. Uh, And what makes me even more nervous about this match is that if it happens, look for Nikki to win. I think uh, you gotta go heel turn here. Ronda Rousey has destroyed Stephanie McMahon every time she's been in the same ring with her. Stephanie is not going to take that shit lying down. You know she's got some tricks up her sleeve, and you know she's going to get revenge on Ronda Rousey. And I think part of the reason why they continued the Rousey and Stephanie angle when Rousey won the title is so they can have a reason to take the title off of her. Now when they have Rousey lose the belt, they can do it without her losing clean because Stephanie can interfere. You can do a heel turn with Nikki or something like that. Uh, Ronda Rousey actually has a match at Hell in the Cell defending the title against Alexa Bliss. Uh, Maybe Nikki interferes in that and costs Rousey the match, and Alexa winds up being the champion again. And then Rousey goes in to face Nikki at Evolution without the belt. I doubt it, but, you know, they could always do that too. If you're going to have the Rousey and Nikki match at Evolution, that means you got to do some sort of a heel turn between now and then. I have no problem with Nikki Bella or Brie Bella being a part of the show, uh, but main event, come on. And that's pretty much all I'm going to mention about Monday Night Raw. You guys saw the rest of it. It's not worth discussing. Let's move on to SmackDown Live and talk about the main event first. And that is, of course, the big controversial heel turn by Becky Lynch that took place at SummerSlam. Fans are all up in arms about this. And again, much like the Roman Reigns situation, they're not entirely wrong. They're not, they're not really wrong at all, the fans, about the situation. The problem is once they get a bug up their ass, they will, they're just relentless to the point where other talent now suffers. Now everybody's shitting on Charlotte. You know, Charlotte is the fucking victim in all of this because everybody now hates her. They think she's the female Roman Reigns. She gets way too many opportunities. She's a seven-time champion. All this fucking nonsense. When in reality, you've got one hell of a female wrestler in Charlotte who's amazingly talented, one of the best wrestlers we've ever seen in the company. She's the daughter of the fucking nature boy Ric Flair, and you disrespectful assholes are going to shit on her face. It's not Charlotte's fault. I agree that Charlotte is a much better heel than a baby face. And I agree that Becky is a much better baby face than a heel. So much like the Braun Strowman situation, they are doing things ass fucking backwards. But guess what? That's WWE. How long have they been doing things ass backwards? For one year? For two years? No. Try 20. And although I don't necessarily disagree with the fans about how stupid it is, I do disagree with the level of outrage in this. Because let me tell you something. I know how these fans think, and I can prove it to you. Envision SummerSlam. Envision this scenario, if you will. Uh, The match at SummerSlam, Becky, Charlotte, and Carmella. Let's say that you still do the Becky Lynch heel turn, but she wins the belt. I guarantee you. 
not one person would be bitching about the heel turn. I went on my podcast twice before SummerSlam even happened. And a lot of people were speculating that maybe WWE could swerve us and turn Becky Lynch heel. And I strongly advised against that in two podcasts, episode 5, 10, and 11, I think, or some shit like that. I was adamantly against that because I was like, why would you do that? It makes no sense. The fans love Becky Lynch, especially if you follow the storyline. She's on this, you know, road to redemption. She's been, you know, racking up victories on TV. She is absolutely adored by the audience, male and female, and you're going to turn her heel? I just didn't think that was a good idea. And some people thought I was wrong. Hey, good mic work? Yeah, you don't think Becky Lynch deserves a chance to be heel? But I think they were saying that in the context of Becky Lynch winning the title as well. So if she would have won the belt and also turned heel, I think the fans would have been fine with it. But I know the fans well enough to know that I think the bigger issue here is that she didn't win the belt and Charlotte did. I think that's really, at the end of the day, what bothers the fans but they're masking it and they're concealing it by this Becky Lynch heel turn doesn't make any sense fucking argument when really in reality they're just mad that she's not champion. So that's my theory on that whole thing. And when it comes to ass backwards logic, the fans are every bit as bad as WWE is. It's like they're a match made in heaven, this beautiful union of crazy, you know, all in the professional wrestling business. So this Becky Lynch drama has been exhausting on Twitter, and um, a lot of people, I think, are losing sight of the fact that uh, Becky is getting a new storyline direction. She is getting something interesting to do. She just doesn't have the belt. Maybe she will get it. She will be facing Charlotte at Hell in a Cell. Charlotte defended the title on SmackDown in the main event against Carmella and beat her. Tapped her out with a figure eight, so luckily it looks like Carmella's days of being champion are over, and I'm happy about that. And then after the match, Stone Cold Becky Lynch hits the ring and beats the piss out of Charlotte, gets on the mic, cuts a promo on her, and says that she's going to take the belt back at Hell in the Cell. So I think this week's heel version of Becky Lynch was a little bit better than last week. I think what happened at the Barclays Center last Tuesday after SummerSlam was a complete mess because the fans were cheering Becky. They refused to boo her. They love her, and they love to see her beat the hell out of Charlotte. So I know I often give the advice of be patient. Sometimes I turn out to be right. Sometimes I turn out to be wrong. I was wrong with Asuka. I told everybody, be patient. She'll get her day. I think a heel turn for Asuka would be good as well um, at some point, because at least a heel turn there would kind of make sense because she seems like she's fizzled, where Becky Lynch made less sense because she seemed like she was on the rise, you know, and getting the fan support behind her and everybody was ready for the big moment and they didn't get it. And then they freaked out and lost their mind. So as far as what else we saw on SmackDown, really good match between uh, Sienna Moss and Daniel Bryan. First time ever these guys have hooked up. I think this whole match got put together uh, with Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella coming out to the ring to cut a promo on The Miz and Maurice. Almas and Zelina interrupted. That led to a one-on-one match. And uh, the ladies got involved. Brie Bella and Maurice both got involved on the outside of the ring. Brie was stopping Zelina from interfering in the match, and she was then attacked by Maurice. And that's when The Miz hit the ring from behind and nailed Daniel Bryan with the skull crushing finale, and the match ended in a disqualification. Maurice then pulled Brie back in the ring and beat the hell out of her right in front of Daniel Bryan as he's laid out from The Miz. And The Miz and Maurice stood over a destroyed Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella. And of course, the four of them are involved in a mixed tag team match at Hell in the Cell in a couple of weeks. I think at this point, it's pretty safe to say that Miz and Maurice are going to go 0-2 in these mixed tags. I can't imagine them getting another one over on Daniel Bryan. It seems like the Miz has really owned Daniel Bryan in this feud. He's one-upped him nearly in every segment every week. Even when Daniel Bryan attacked the Miz backstage, Miz still turned the tables and wound up smashing a vase of flowers over his head or something like that. And then, of course, he won the match at SummerSlam. So I think here, you got to have Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella win the mixed tag, you know, where you can stretch out the feud and Daniel Bryan and Miz can feud into greatest, or I'm sorry, not greatest Royal Rumble, but uh, the Super Show and Survivor Series and hopefully carry this shit into 2019. Um, But that's a big if. I did like the segment with AJ Styles and Samoa Joe as well. AJ was cutting a promo in the ring and Joe appeared on the uh, screen from, I think, the garage area or the parking area or whatever. And he winds up pulling out a cell phone and calling Wendy, AJ's wife. And asked him how the kids were doing and shit like that. So again, they're getting really personal here. They got another match for the title at Hell in the Cell. And I think a case could be made for this match to be inside the cell. According to what I have written down, right now it's not. It's just a straight one-on-one match for the title. I don't know if they'll wind up making it no DQ or something like that. Or they could throw it inside the Hell in the Cell. But if they did that, that means you would have three Hell in the Cell matches on the pay-per-view. And I think usually we only see two. 
And uh, one of those matches was also set up on SmackDown. Jeff Hardy has, in fact, challenged Randy Orton to a Hell in a Cell match. I believe that match is official. And uh, Hardy and uh, Orton had a little promo on SmackDown. And I think that's good. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, that it did look like they were moving in that direction. Jeff Hardy has said publicly in interviews recently that he would really like to be a part of a Hell in a Cell match. So it looks like WWE is going to allow him to be in one. I just uh, ask Jeff Hardy uh, to be careful. Man, I mean, I'm telling you, you're 40 years old, maybe 41, whatever you are. Um, Just don't die, if at all possible. I would uh, really appreciate it, and I think your fans would too. Uh, But I'm kind of looking forward to that. Randy Orton and Jeff Hardy, two legends. They're inside of a Hell in a Cell. Why not? You know what I mean? Um, King Booker uh, returning on SmackDown was also pretty funny. So you had Trish returning over on Raw, and you had King Booker showing up on SmackDown in the opening segment to uh, hang out with the New Day. They all wound up doing spinner Roonies, and it was a big, fun-loving segment. And I guess they're doing another uh, tag team tournament to determine uh, the new number one contenders for the tag team titles. So again, no storyline development here at all, or no feud, or no personal issue between any teams. WWE is just going to have a tournament and decide who's getting the title shot. So I would like to see a little bit more going on the tag teams like we did in the 80s, but that seems to be, you know, 20 years obsolete, 25 years obsolete for that matter. So that brings us to the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. We've got about six matches, I believe, officially announced for this pay-per-view. Uh, we've got uh, WWE title on the line, AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe. We know that. Uh, Universal title on the line, Braun Strowman versus Roman Reigns inside the Hell in a Cell. Jeff Hardy and Randy Orton are also going to have a one-on-one match inside the Hell in a Cell. We're going to get Becky Lynch challenging Charlotte for the SmackDown women's title. We're going to have Alexa Bliss challenging Ronda Rousey for the Raw women's title. And we've got Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella versus Miz and Marie in a mixed tag. So I guess we're going to get a tag team title match as well. Probably two of them, one on the pre-show and one on the main card for Raw and SmackDown. I don't know if Seth's going to wind up having an IC title match, probably, against Dolph Ziggler, or maybe it turns out to be Seth and Dean versus Dolph and Drew tag team match at the pay-per-view that could be possible so uh, we'll probably find out more details on hell in the cell in the next couple of weeks on tv and since we're talking about wwe pay-per-view cards we got a few matches also announced for the super showdown i think the date on that is october 6th don't quote me and i think that's over in melbourne australia and of course on the top of the card in what right now is rumored to be the main event is the triple h undertaker match a match that they are making a huge deal out of we saw a big long boring ass promo by triple h last week they rehashed the whole damn thing this week on monday night raw and uh, i'm going to tolerate this match out of respect for these two legends but honestly truthfully i don't want to see this match um i mean i i just thought it was an attraction match much like john cena versus triple h was at the greatest royal rumble they're just going to go out there they're going to go through the motions they're not going to really even do anything to each other and give the fans a thrill and the entrances and the gong and the water spitting and all that crap with the two of them and that's it but it looks like they're building this to be an actual thing and here we go again they're saying they're claiming that this will be the last time these two men ever face I think I'm inclined to believe it this time, only because The Undertaker, I think, is in his late hundreds. So you got to think that he's going to be hanging it up pretty soon. And I can't imagine another situation where these two guys would be in a ring on a pay-per-view. Um, so this Super Showdown better be it for the two of them, because we already saw the end of an era match like six years ago. Um, we also have uh, The Shield taking on the Super Team. This match is also announced for the card. So you're going to have uh, Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose, and Seth Rollins versus Braun Strowman, Drew McIntyre, and Dolph Ziggler. We've got the Bella Twins. And Ronda Rousey versus the Riot Squad, this could be where you see the Nikki Bella heel turn. If you are going to do Nikki Bella and Ronda Rousey, which I've already thrown up twice over in this podcast, so I don't want to do it again. I'll try to swallow that one back down. If you are going to do that match, I think uh, this will be the stage where you do the heel turn. Because they're teammates, and why not? Have a Nikki turn on Rousey in the match. It gives the Riot Squad a huge victory over some really big names. And uh, it sets up Nikki and Rousey at Evolution. So there you go. You can uh, ponder that possibility for a couple of seconds. And they are also advertising AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe for the title. I don't know if they're really spoiling the outcome of Hell in the Cell and AJ is going to retain and face Joe uh, for the title again, or if Joe is going to be champion uh, heading into Australia. Don't really know there yet. Uh, So that'll kind of wrap it up for your WWE news. Uh, We'll move into All In here and kind of give this show a quick preview. As far as my plans for this Saturday during All In, they are still a little bit up in the air. You guys wouldn't believe how close I was earlier on today to getting that night off. I really thought I was going to be able to work some stuff out to where I could be home on Saturday night. 
but it's Labor Day weekend and it's really busy for me and the whole thing fell through. I really thought I was going to pull it off and then it kind of collapsed on me. I wasn't able to do it, but then I just realized there's still like a 20% chance that I might be able to score Saturday night off. And if I do, I will buy the pay-per-view and I will live stream my reaction to it on YouTube. So unfortunately, I don't have any official announcement yet for you here in this episode, but give me a follow over on Twitter and uh, go like my Facebook page. If I am able to come up on Saturday, I will make announcements about that on uh, both of those social media sites. So make sure you give me a follow and a like. If there's any way I can pull it off, I am going to do it because I really, really want to watch this show and I want to give Cody and the Bucks 40 bucks. I would really like to pay them and watch the show and support them. But if I'm not going to be home to watch it live, I don't see the point. But I really want to partake in this. I want to I want to support the show and support the cause. I think they've done an amazing job with this. All of the promotion has been great. All the StarCast stuff and everything going on that weekend. It's like a little miniature WrestleMania weekend. I mean, they have so many people in town. So many legends are there. There's so many conventions and all sorts of shit going on. And then the matches itself, the card itself, and the show itself looks pretty amazing. And I don't watch a whole lot of independent wrestling or even Japanese wrestling or even Impact Wrestling these days. But I'm pretty much familiar with almost everybody on this card, uh, which is saying something for me because I hardly ever pay attention to this stuff. So I think the card is very stacked, a lot of big names there, and I think we're going to see a lot of surprises. Uh, So according to what I have uh, written down here, we've got uh, the Zero Hour pre-show. I think that's going to be aired on WGN. That's pretty cool. That's a Chicago station. Uh, you got the Briscoes versus SCU on that, and you also have the Over Budget Battle Royal uh, with a whole bunch of cool names in there like Billy Gunn, Colt Cabana. Jimmy Jacobs, uh, Brian Cage, among others. Also some talk of some surprises Uh, like Neville. This would be a perfect place for Neville to show up. Neville, it has been reported, is completely free and clear of WWE. He can go work wherever he wants. I think it would be ridiculous if he did not show up on this show. So I think there is a excellent chance that Neville could show up somewhere. If he did, I think showing up in this Battle Royal would be awesome because the winner of the Battle Royal faces Jay Lethal for the Ring of Honor title later on in the card. So how cool would that be? Um, If not, Neville can just do a run-in somewhere during another match. I don't know where, uh, but I definitely would love to see Neville's face uh, at All In. We've got uh, the Young Bucks and Kota Ibushi taking on Rey Mysterio, Rey Phoenix, and Bandito. That should be a really fun six-man match. We've got Hangman Page versus Joey Janela, Marty Skrull versus Okada, Christopher Daniels versus Steven Amell. So it's kind of cool to see him be a part of all this and uh, the promotion. We've got a four-way women's match on the card, and we also have uh, Kenny Omega versus Pentagon Jr. That'll be ridiculous. We've got uh, Jay Lethal, like I said, taking on the winner of the Battle Royal. And I believe in the main event, Nick Aldis is defending the NWA title against Cody. Um, If there's one predictable match on this card, I would probably say that's it, uh, just given the history of that title belt. And, um, you know, Dusty, you know, wore that uh, that very belt for uh, many years uh, back in the old NWA days. It's not the same NWA, but it's the same belt. And every time I see it, it just, uh, you know, kind of brings back a lot of memories. So I think it would be really cool just for Cody, you know, and uh, I think his dad is probably looking down quite proud of him right now. And uh, if he was able to promote and, uh, you know, sell out a big arena like this and he's able to put this whole thing together and uh, following the tradition of the old school promoters, it's not uncommon for promoters to put the belts on themselves. I would actually get a kick out of that if we saw it. And plus, I also think I got nothing against uh, Nick Aldis at all, um, but I think Cody is a better worker than him. So I would like to see Cody uh, get his hands on the 10 pounds of gold. I have taken a look at some of the videos on their YouTube channel. That stuff's really well done uh, for something that's non-WWE, for them to be able to hold up and do something on the same level production value wise. I'm always impressed with anybody that can do that. Uh, So I think uh, all those little vignettes are well put together. I didn't really like Tim Storm as champion, didn't even really know who he was. I'm like, where the hell has this guy been uh, my whole life? Um, So him being champion and the way he was trying to carry it, you know, with the prestige of, you know, the, the old school wrestlers, you know, back in the sixties and seventies, I did like that, but it, uh, it didn't feel like he was that credible of a champion to me. Uh, Nick Aldis, I think is, uh, much more modern. And then of course, Cody Rhodes, uh, with his family name and his bloodline. Um, I would very much like to see him win the NWA title at all in. So it looks like this show is going to be phenomenal. Congratulations, uh, to Cody and the Bucks for, uh, putting together quite the amazing show. It looks like, um, hopefully they will have no hiccups. Hopefully this thing will uh, go off without a hitch. They're going to be on regular pay-per-view, I believe. And I think you can also buy this on Fight TV, which if I do, if I am home to watch All In, I'll probably pull up Fight TV and uh, order it there somehow so I can be in front of my computer while I watch it. 
haven't ordered anything on pay-per-view off a satellite system or cable system in four years, five years, something like that. It's been a long time. So uh, I really hope I can pull something off and be home Saturday to watch this awesome show. If I can't, I will uh, try to catch it somehow uh, that night if I can find a stream of it. Otherwise, I'll probably fork out the money and watch the replay uh, just so I can get some sort of a review for you up on Sunday. So that's kind of my plan for the moment. So like I said, stay tuned to my Twitter page and keep a lookout for any announcement on what I'll be doing on Saturday for All In, just in case I can actually watch this thing and stream it on YouTube. So that is it for me. I'm going to get out of here. I've got a lot of things going on on the channel. If I do wind up being here on Saturday, you'll get me for a stream there. I'll, I'll of course, be up here on Monday night for my regular weekly Monday Night Raw watch along, and I will be a little bit less spaced out this time. I was very tired last week. I even signed off the stream as soon as Raw went off the air. Um, I've just had a hellacious couple of weeks at work. This is my busy season, and it is finally over after Labor Day. So I'm really looking forward to enjoying a little break and I can work on some other uh, videos. I got a couple of $100 donation videos in the works. I've got one coming up on September 11th and then I have another one coming up a couple of days after that. One of them is TNA related and the other one is Undertaker related and uh, they're going to be a lot of fun to do and I need to get cracking on those. So that's my plan uh, for the next couple of weeks. So I will talk to you guys real soon. I'll either see you on Saturday night or I will see you on Sunday for some sort of an all-in review. You guys take care, and I'll talk to you real soon. Peace. Thank you.